A Pruning Psalm, a sermon delivered by Dr. Rob Blackburn on February 23, 2014 at Central United Methodist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. Our passage for this morning comes from Psalm 131. Hear now these words. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I think most of you would agree with me that the Christian life needs maintenance. Uh, It requires an attending to. What did G.K. Chesterton said? um, Even the best things in life, if left alone, will probably deteriorate. This morning you heard this Psalm 131. Not a very long psalm, you heard all of it. Um, But it's a maintenance psalm. It's a pruning psalm. You know, you know about pruning. We see it happen in our gardens all the time, the cutting back of bushes and shrubs. Try to describe that to a rookie gardener sometime, and, and they're going to say it sounds like an act of mutilation. Um, it seems like you're ruining rather than helping a plant, but you know the truth. You let some rose bushes go for a few years. Oh, they're looking good at the beginning of the summer, growing up toward the trellis, and you say it's going to be a bumper year. Then disappointment. All the blossoms, they're they're, they're scrawny, not that many. What's happened? Well, the branches have grown too far from the roots. They need pruning. This is a pruning psalm, cutting back that which looks all right to those who don't know any better. It's trying to reduce the distance between the human heart and its roots and God. And what is the psalmist trying to cut back? Um, Ugly ambition unruly arrogance, listen to him. He said, my, my eyes are, will not be raised too high. Um, I want to surrender all conceit. I don't want to waste my time with grandiose schemes and things that are beyond too marvelous for me. But he said, I have quieted my soul. I have found security in God like a child finds rest in its mother's lap. My eyes are not raised too high, cutting back arrogance. I think this is a little hard for us to comprehend. In other words, the words are pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but arrogance is one of those things that just kind of slips in, looks kind of innocuous at first. And after all, it is at least superficially related to the virtue called aspiration. Aspiration, the um, impatience with mediocrity heartfelt desire to move to our best. It's Paul saying, I press on to the high mark of calling in Christ Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you take the energies of aspiration and take God out of the picture and replace it with the inflated self-portrait, it won't be long till it becomes arrogant. I think another reason we have a hard time thinking about this kind of pruning is our culture. I mean, let's be honest, we're Americans and we all have been introduced to the the myth of the limitless self. It goes like this. You can be all things and do all things if just given enough time and enough effort, your place in the universe is really without limits. You know, I don't think this is the easiest kind of sermon to listen to. I don't think it's the easiest kind of sermon to preach. When I look at my list of sermons through the years, I have really turned to the other side of this issue. I have preached a good many sermons that have tried to build up human esteem. But I think our psalmist is suggesting that the problem also runs in the other direction. I can remember reading Reinhold Niebuhr who said, Faith is imperiled on two sides. On the one side, it's imperiled by our whole sense of 
despair, and on the other side, it's imperiled by optimism. And he said being overly optimistic about oneself is the greatest danger. <laughs> Been in a bookstore lately? I bet some of you have. And you've seen all those self-help books, hundreds of self-improvement treatises, all of them trying to tell you that you're terrific. The common thread running through a lot of these books is that uh, human beings are suffering from a low self-image. They have underestimated their capacities. So the role of pop psychology is to pump you up. Isn't it interesting, though, that two of the leading voices of psychology in the 20th century, Alfred Adler and Carl Jung, listen to what they said. That the major illusions of human beings, the major illusion of human beings is not inferiority, but superiority. That by and large, we have uh, an unrealistic high view of ourselves. I think that was supported in this book, Inflated Self, by Greg Myers. This is not a collection of opinions. It's a compendium of surveys and questionnaires, one chapter. He deals with these surveys that were taken of graduating high school seniors, and they were asked to compare themselves to their peers in different capacities of life. First one was dealing with leadership ability. This is interesting. Over 80% of the respondents listed themselves as well above average. Only 2% listed themselves as below average. And getting along with others. Zero percent of the respondents, 829,000 high school seniors, zero percent classified themselves as below average. Forty-five percent put themselves in the upper two percent. I don't think then the evidence suggests that high school seniors are walking around with an inferiority, but more like a superiority complex. John Paul called Cadal, his work was listed in another one of the chapters. He mentions that the more persons admire a trait, the more they believe that trait is true of themselves and not others. Not long ago, someone shared with me um, one of these self descriptions that a man placed in one of these dating online kind of services. I'm going to read this to you verbatim. After saying that he was looking for the perfect woman, he now described his perfect self. And this is how he described it. He said, if you get me, you will get growth encouragement, whatever that is, intellectual depth and emotional stability. You will get an engaging affable, attractive, articulate, independently wealthy, huggable, serious, humorous 49-year-old. <laughs> so where does the swagger, where does the inflation come from? Some would say, well, it's just representative of some weakness covered up, too painful to face. How does it go? Show me a superiority complex, and I'll show you an inferiority complex whistling in the dark. There may be some truth to that. Biblical wisdom, though, suggests this is a character flaw. It's an unwillingness to grow up and to grow into the truth about our creatureliness an unwillingness to give up the egocentricity of the crib and to accept the notion that we are not all wise and all powerful and perfect and superior in all ways. Arrogance. Consequences to that, I, I can attest to that. I remember coming out of theology school, a young minister, first appointment, and I'd read the discipline that would describe the task of United Methodist Minister, and there'd be these evaluation forms, three to four pages, all the things that we're supposed to do and hopefully do well. And I can remember sitting there as a young minister and saying, get back, watch out, I'm going to do it all, and I'm going to do it all well. Watch me. Looking back, Hindsight reflection. I realized that there were times I did not turn to the others that God had placed around me that would have rounded me out, that could have balanced my weaknesses with their strengths. 
you, you see what was happening? Kind of unknowingly and arrogantly, I was um, diminishing myself, and diminishing the body of believers of which I was a part. Arrogance, it'll separate us from one another. You can be sure of that. And when you're going through a season of um, having to pump up your swagger, what do we do? We look side to side. We don't look to some omega point out in front of us. We look side to side. We try to find someone over whom we can declare a victory. We're the winner, they're the loser. We're the insider and they're the outsider. See what that does to the human community? What do you think it does to our relationship to God? The Bible describes the grace of God as rivers, streams, streams of mercy ever flowing. I think one of the most devastating effects of the sin of pride is that it's not water soluble, it's oil based. It recognizes no need for mercy. It's almost impossible for God to get through to someone who has it all and has it all figured out. So, what does the psalmist say? He said, Get out your scissors, get out your shears. Let's do some pruning. He says, my eyes are not going to raise, be raised too high. I'm not going to try to rule the roost. I, I'm going to rein in all grandiosity. He's coming back to his creatureliness before the creation and the creator. I, I'm not going to try to run my life or the life of others. That's God's business. I will not um, pretend to have invented the meaning of the universe. I will not strut about demanding that um, I be placed at the center of my neighborhood and my family and my work. I, I will see how I fit into the whole, strong in some ways, weak in others. All right. So if the psalmist suggests that we're not to be uh, proud and clamorous and arrogant, so what does that mean? That we're to be mousy, cringing, insecure ones? No, no. Once you and I realize the danger of trying to be too much, there's the opposite danger of being too little. Some Christians begin to think, oh, if our greatest temptation is to try to be everything, then maybe the Christian solution is to be nothing. So, you know, we have the doormat Christian, the dish rag saint. You know, come on, just walk all over me, wipe your feet on me. I just weepily clinging to God, hoping that someday we'll have a better place in the sweet by and by. No, we're not talking about that. I like what someone said, Christian humility is not thinking less of oneself or more of oneself. It's getting to the place we don't have to think about our place at all. It's like our somebodyness has now been given to us. We get ourselves off our hands. I can hear that in our psalmist. Listen again to him. He says, you know, my soul's been quieted. You see, he's, he's, he's found his place. He's found his sense of security. Where? Lying back in the arms of God's acceptance and grace. Hear the good news. Our value is anchored in something more substantial and more lasting than our pumped up virtue and wisdom. It is anchored in an ongoing relationship with God who tells us the truth about ourselves. And what's that? We're human. What does that mean? Well, we're fragmented and fractured and scattered at times, of course. Mistaken, yes, sure. Limited in ways, of course, and yet God's masterpiece. Yeah. We celebrate that every time we celebrate communion. People come dripping out of those waters and we say, now once and for all you know who you are. There's no mistake about that. This is the best God can do. You're God's masterpiece created in the image, recreated in Christ Jesus. And what does that mean? That I can be all things and know all things and do all things? No, but it means I can do some things that are filled with significance and meaning. What a group of people in here. My goodness, I'm just kind of taking you all in. What a hobgoblin of backgrounds and interests and abilities. But you know you boil us all down till there's nothing left but the stain in the bottom of the cup. And you know what? We're made pretty much of the same stuff. You know what the Bible says? That's good stuff. 
It's really good stuff. Thomas Merton discovered that one day. Thomas Merton, the monk and writer, he wrote this book, Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. And in his book, he notes that he'd been in the monastery for 17 years, and now he's in Louisville, Kentucky. He's standing on the corner of Walnut and 2nd Street, and he's looking about, and the crowds are coming and going. And he said, all of a sudden, I just felt like I was theirs and they were mine. We were all made of the same stuff. And he said, maybe that doesn't sound much to people that are reading this, but he said, look, I had spent the last 17 years of my life thinking that I was different from all other men. And on this day, this was my prayer. Thank you, thank you. I am like all men. I am a human among humans. And listen to what he went on and said. I have discovered I have the immense joy and job of being a man, of being a member of the human race in which God himself became incarnate. Isn't that enough? I mean, really, isn't that enough? Do our, do our eyes need to be raised any higher than that? Do we need to pump up some kind of swagger? Why do we uh, denigrate at times being human, huh? Talk about it as though it's liability. Well, I'm only human. You got the shortstop and he handles, you know, 300 ground balls in a row and all the throws to first base without making an error and he's just doing great. And uh-oh, here comes one and he bobbles it. And what does he say? What everybody say? Well, you know, he's only human. Well, what was he when he was handling the 300 ground balls, huh? I thought Luke offered a meaningful prayer today, and some of you might want to come up to Luke after the service and say, Luke, thank you. That was, um, that was a helpful prayer. That helped me connect with God. And I hope if you say that to Luke, he'll just kind of stand straight and tall and say, well, after all, after all, I'm, I'm human. That's enough, isn't it? That's enough. We don't have to inflate that. God's masterpiece. Gerald figured that out. Gerald of um, 3rd Street in St. Petersburg. I, I, that's kind of where he worked every day. I, I was a young associate downtown church, a lot like Central. Um, there was Williams Park, and then right up against Williams Park, right on the side of the church was 3rd Street. There was Moss Brothers Department Store, a couple of other retail places. And, and Gerald worked for them. Uh, he, he washed the windows. He kept the kind of front, you know, way, swept out, and had a little... Gray uniform I remember wore every day, and his name was kind of stenciled in over his pocket. And look, people said that um, Gerald had some limitations. I don't know. I never heard any kind of diagnosis. I know he had a sturdy work ethic, and he had an unbelievable friendly countenance. He was kind of like the greeter of Third Street. Everybody that lived and moved around downtown St. Pete knew Gerald. I got to know Gerald. One day he said to me, Rob, that's that's, that's your church. You work over there, big red brick church. Yes, yeah, first method. Yeah, that's, that's where I work. He says, well, I've been thinking, yeah, but okay, what's, what's up, Gerald? He says, well, I was wondering, it'd be all right if I came there one Sunday. Well, I said, of course. I said, let's, let's don't even talk about this in terms of just generality. I said, let, let's just make a commitment right here. I'm going to be looking for you. Um, I'm going to be looking for you Sunday, all right? He said, I'll be there. Oh, he was there. He showed up and came about five or six Sundays in a row. And then I think it was a Tuesday morning, he shows up at my office. After five or six weeks, shows up in my office, and he's dressed on a Tuesday morning coat and tie. I never seen Gerald in a suit, full suit, white shirt, nice tie. I said, Gerald, what's up? Are you going to a wedding, going to a funeral? He says, no, no, I came to talk to you, and I, I, I wanted to talk about something important. And I thought I should be dressed for the occasion. I said, what are we going to talk about? And he said, we're going to talk about my being baptized, my joining the church. Yeah. Isn't that something? He, he dressed up for that occasion. Yeah. Next Sunday, Gerald was baptized. And he came rising out of those waters and I think he had a pretty good sense of who he was. 
Four days later, he shows up at the church office, not in my office this time, office of Bill Simons. He, he was in charge of what we called every member in ministry, trying to match people's gifts and interests with the needs of the church and the community, get them involved. And so there he is at Bill Simons' office, and he says, hello, Mr. Simons, hello, hello, Gerald. You know, I've been a member of the church now for four days. Four days, that's good, yeah. How's it going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, how's it? Everything? Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad to be a member of the church. But I was wondering, wondering about what? Well, I've been a member of this church now for four days, and when are you going to give me something to do? You heard that? I, I've seen people around for 40 years and they have never asked that question. <laughs> four days, four days, and he, he, he wants to know. Surely God and church has something for me to do. And I thought Bill Simons was pretty, pretty wise. He just said, well, you just tell me, you, you just tell me something about yourself, and maybe how you see yourself. What, what do you see yourself doing, Gerald? He said, Third Street. What do you mean, Third Street? He said, that's where I work every day. People see Gerald, they think Third Street. They see Third Street, they think Gerald. And he says, you know, I've been noticing there's this little... Well, it's not a big door. It's not the main door, but one of the little side doors is over there on 3rd Street. And I noticed some people come in there for Sunday school and they come in there for church. And I was thinking, I'll get in my suit and you put me out there by that door. And you know what's going to maybe happen? People be driving by and they're going to see Gerald standing there. And maybe somebody will say, if there's a place for Gerald, there, 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 there must be a place for me. Where do you think we put Gerald the next week? Out there on 3rd Street. Here's what I like about the story. There's no grandiosity to this. This isn't some pumped up version of humanity trying to strut around and arrogantly hold their life up over somebody else, no. But this is a person who is rooted in something more substantial than that. They've been baptized. He knows who he is. He's, he's a human being. He's fragmented, yes. Limited, of course. But God's masterpiece. Full-blooded, fully endowed child of God. Of course God had something significant for Gerald to do. Should it surprise any of us? Because he is made of the same stuff as you and me. Oh God, at times we've stumbled into um, low self-esteem and there may be somebody here uh, feeling very unworthy. At times though, we have, um, we have vaulted ourselves up the, the ladder of inflation. We have strutted about in a way that separates us from each other and from you. Wherever we are, dear God, may we find our way back to your grace. And may that quiet our souls. And May we lie back in your arms so we can be all that you've made us to be in Christ's name.